welcome this is Andrew Gibbons and if you're watching this video it means that at some point in your life you've picked up a copy of Awareness Through Movement the book by Moshe Feldenkrais on his work called the Feldenkrais Method and it means that you're also interested in improving the way that you organize your body when you move and you're interested in developing a daily personal practice through the lessons that are described in the book and today we're going to take you through the very first lesson in the book called what is good posture this is an extremely important and rich lesson where Feldenkrais takes you through the act of going from sitting to standing and helps you explore ways to make it more and more efficient elegant comfortable and light and since the lessons in the book are not illustrated this video is going to give you a way to visually see the principles that he describes in the lesson and go much deeper into your own practice. Now the first part of the lesson is done in standing. Feldenkrais has you begin the lesson by standing up and slowly swaying your body from side to side and then in circles over the base of support of your feet. Now, the idea is to create a clear line of support from the ground up to the very top of your head so that from the very start of the lesson you're experiencing yourself moving in space in such a way that the weight above the ground is clearly being supported at every moment through your contact with the ground now he recommends that you do these movements 15 to 20 times and generally speaking the slower and the more gently you go the more you'll be able to clarify your experience you can see me here starting to sag a little bit as I go. My pelvis starts to slip out to the side underneath my head, and in a moment I'll get even sloppier. Here, where now I'm really just sort of circling the middle, the pelvis, or then only the head over the pelvis, I'm not really elongating my body. Here's even, I'm even more compressed, even more slumped, but still I'm circling the weight over the base. What he's looking for is a way for you to lengthen your body, as you see me doing here so that you're really at your longest distance between the top of your head and the soles of your feet. In this next instruction, Feldenkrais has you circling over one leg. The majority of your weight is over one hip joint, while the other leg is just on the tiptoe and balancing you. You're still circling your head, but it's mostly over one hip joint more than the other. So you're having to learn how to be stable over one hip joint more than the other. And this is a sneaky way of introducing the function of the hip joints before we actually sit down and get to the, seat, the seated part of the lesson. So as you can see that when I'm really supported well through my left hip joint I'm free to move and the right leg even though the heel is lifted the right leg is actually free but when I'm poorly supported there you saw me fall the right leg is actually quite heavy and the movement in my pelvis and in my center gets sloppier and my head gets stiffer but as I lengthen and I find a higher point of support on the left hip joint the right leg becomes easier and easier to lift and this is because of the direct and accurate line of support I have through the left hip joint so I'll repeat that the ease of movement that I have in the right leg is only because of the accuracy of the support of my skeleton through my left leg and this is an important principle that Feldenkrais explores in every awareness through movement lesson Placing your hands up behind your head with your elbows lifted like this helps to distribute more body weight higher up on your spine. And this is a good way of improving the quality of support from your foot. You'll have to aim up a little bit higher through yourself. You can practice putting the foot in different places behind you, and you can also practice, like I do here, falling. Falling off the hip joint, letting the pelvis sag and you can link that experience to the aesthetic quality in the leg that you lift, how heavy it gets, and then when you lengthen yourself, when you find that high point on the hip joint, you can also link that experience to having a much lighter leg to lift. Now this principle of finding the appropriate skeletal support in order to make the muscular work efficient is a mainstay of the Feldenkrais method. And here you have an example where the action is not about lifting the leg, it's about supporting the entire body accurately on the top of the hip joint to facilitate it. Now before we get into the seated portion of the lesson, I just want to go over a few things about the bottom of the pelvis. Many people have heard about tilting your pelvis or rolling your pelvis. 
we really want to understand what it means to use the sit bones on the bottom of the pelvis to get an accurate support up through our head when we're sitting. So here I am sitting on a roller and gently leaning forward in different ways. You can see that when I tuck my sit bones underneath me, they point forward. It tends to pull the middle of my back backwards behind the base of support. And this is a poor way of doing it. Another poor way of doing it is when I overexert in my lower back. I pinch the lower back and try to roll the top forward. Now the problem here is that we need the organization of the pelvis to go up and through the head and not go across and shear across our spine, either backward or forward. We need the gliding of the sit bones. When they go back away from the knees, we want the gliding of the sit bones to produce a lift up and through the longitudinal axis of the spine so that the entire weight of the torso is carried elegantly up and forward. Now as we take this circling idea into sitting, Feldenkrais is clear that he wants this long line of the spine, this integrity, to be intact. In fact, he says the head being supported on the spine as a rod. So as you start to make the circles, he wants there to be kind of an unbroken line between the base and the top, not a kind of wiggling, a disjointed or contorted spine, the way you see me doing here, but much more of a unified spine. Now this requires really accurate coordination between the bottom and the top, and it requires the use of your legs. And you can use little tricks, like here I'm using this stick to help clarify the image for myself. You can see how the bottom of the stick makes a little circle on the table that supports equal and opposite the directions of the top of the stick, or in, which matches my head. And this is an excellent way to practice. You can use the stick on the front of your body, or you can put it on the back to help clarify the image there. But the whole idea here is to discover this integrity of the length of the spine in all the directions. Now one of the great things about the Feldenkrais method as an awareness practice is the way that you can learn how timing affects your movements. Good timing has everything to do with using your muscles efficiently. And for most people when they go from sitting to standing, they contract the quadriceps, the big muscles in the legs, too quickly and it actually prevents them from going forward. Here you'll see me squeeze the leg muscles fast by pressing my feet against the ground. And it actually drives me backwards. And this is what most people are struggling against when they try to get up and contract the leg muscles too fast. You can see the blue line represents sort of a wall beyond which my head doesn't seem to be able to move. Now when I time the muscles differently, when I contract them more slowly and distribute the contraction of the legs over the course of leaning forward, when that relationship is smoother, my movement is smoother, and more importantly the counterbalance is smoother. There I got disrupted, here again I got stopped. But if I slowly delay the contraction of the legs longer and longer, you'll see that the counterbalance only improves more and more. And this is one of the great strategies in awareness through movement, is actually your ability to study the mistakes, to actually study the errors, to find out how they actually interfere with you, and become more and more intimate with the internal changes that take place, the little actions, the little glitches that you make, that interfere with a very smooth and efficient way of organizing yourself. But this process of studying, contracting too soon, then delaying, then delaying further, this is really the path towards improvement. It's not just about trying to do the right thing. Now another brilliant part of the instruction Feldenkrais gives on timing the leg muscles is he says that as you come forward, instead of pressing your feet into the ground, he says, imagine lifting your knees away from the floor as you come forward. Now here you see me sort of doing this one leg at a time, lifting the knee and feeling that draw my thigh bone back into the hip joint more, which is a major part of how you get the, the proper lift. So as you're coming forward, the idea is to actually prevent weight from going into your feet, and on the way down too. The idea is that you imagine lifting away from the ground rather than trying to press into the ground. And this includes on the way down too. You don't want to fall. You don't want to feel your weight falling into your feet. But it's as if the ground is lifting up and through you throughout the entire movement, whether it's forward or backward. And this is an extremely useful practice. And in the next step of the lesson, our attention turns to understanding how to quiet and lengthen the neck muscles. For most of us, as we go to make the movement from sitting to standing, very often the back of the neck gets contracted too much. 
you'll see it in the way that the chin gets thrust forward or that the, the back of the neck gets pinched. And so in this lesson, you can place your own hands on the skin at the back of your neck and sometimes also at the, the lower back and really sense as you're moving a few times whether or not the muscles on the back of the neck contract unnecessarily. Here you can see I've got the back of my hand on my lower back and you want the contact of your hands to be sensitive, not gripping, not poking, but just light so that you can feel small changes. Here you can see me collapse and as I collapse the back of the neck shortens and you can see that the trajectory of my head to go forward is much more down than it is forward. As I lengthen and allow the back of the neck to stay long and quiet, you can see that the, the trajectory that the top of my head makes is now much more further forward. It's more like I'm bringing my chest out over my knees and not the, not the forehead or the chin. And the further you can bring the weight, the, the more you can bring your, the weight of your chest and your head out over your knees, the better your biomechanical counterbalance is, which makes your pelvis a lot lighter to lift. You can see here I'll collapse. I strain in my lower back and now the head just pitches straight forward down. You can see the pelvis is much heavier to lift. But as I lengthen, the head goes further out and now as I come out over the base of support of the feet, I've got more weight in front, so the weight in back is much easier to lift. Another way of making contact with the weight of your head is with one of the instructions in the lesson where he says to go ahead and catch the hair on the top of your head. And as you go forward a few times, the idea is to actually pull your hair in the direction of your spine. Now there you saw me break, but the idea is to pull through the length of your spine the entire time as a way of helping the support that's coming from the legs to find its way up and through to the crown of your head so that you really learn this trajectory throughout each step in the movement. You can see that when I round my back I literally pull the weight of my head away from my hands and really you can really actually experience the the drastic contortion you go through and how your neck really suffers when you do that. Of course another way to do this is to hold the sides of your head with your hands so that your thumb and forefinger are on the back and front of your ears. And you're looking for your thumb to make contact with the base of your skull. There's a ridge just along the back right up behind your ear. If you just gently bring your thumb there you'll feel it. And the idea is to actually become sensitive to the space there <clears throat> at the top of your spine where your head, where your spine actually enters up into your skull and to move forward in such a way that you can sense the slightest bit of compression, the slightest bit of contortion that starts to happen whenever you begin to make the movement to go forward. As you go, as you practice, you can move more and more towards this idea of feeling that the spine actually lifts up into the head and that the head feels free and light the entire time. In the beginning, many people, they'll pull on the head, they'll be too rough, but you can introduce little auxiliary movements like I'm doing here where you turn the head from side to side very gently <clears throat> and you see if there's a way to go forward without interrupting the gentle back and forth of the head. This can be a very good introduction to understanding how the support from below affects the freedom that you have above and how when you compromise it, as you see me do here, the moment my head starts to freeze, the moment I contract in the wrong ways, the moment my weight starts to fall towards the floor is exactly when the head stops being able to move freely and my forward motion becomes hampered. I'm even able to turn my head while I'm pulling on it, so it's like, a, it's like I'm rotating around a spit. Now this next part here, I have my hands up behind my head with my elbows pointing forward. But you're going to see me pick up this white roller and actually balance it on my elbows. And this is just a way to practice having the shoulders actually further down into my back so that I can actually practice having my upper back as far forward underneath the weight of my head as I can comfortably. You'll see me sort of going forward and back using circles. There I collapsed, and part of the collapse is I lost the control of the roller. And you'll see that when the upper part of my back remains powerfully lengthened and arched, I have a much higher bearing in my head, and I'm able to keep the support of my elbows up underneath the roller so it doesn't roll off, except when it does. 
Other ways of training and using this particular part of the lesson is I've uh, got a, about a 12 pound uh, weight bar here and I've got my hands behind my head and now I really have to powerfully work the muscles in my upper back. I don't want my lower back to do the work as much. I want my lower back for length, but I do want to be able to train the upper part of my back to support the weight of my arms and head skillfully. So this is a fairly light bar, but even the bar itself provides me an object that I can aim my support up and through. It's not about lifting weight. It's about using the weight to study my support. Now here I'm doing a much more advanced variation. This is not in the book, but I thought I'd just include it. I have the bar in my hands up and above and behind my head, much in the way that a, a weightlifter would come up into a snatch. And again, this is just another variation to challenge the way that my upper back, the way I'm able to organize my upper back to support my head and the weight of my arms so that my shoulder blades are actively part of the, the process of coming forward to stand. And you'll notice that as I go from sitting to standing and reverse, that my spine really has to come forward and up between my shoulder blades. Now as we start to get to the latter half of the lesson, Feldenkrais introduces the instruction of making rhythmical movements with your knees. And this is a very crafty way of getting you to delay any contraction of your quadricep muscles. The movements are just gentle in and out, they're kind of these purposeless opening and closing of the knees as you lean forward as if to get up. But the idea here is to not do anything that would interrupt the easy back and forth of the knees. And this constraint is a very crafty way of getting you to inhibit any unnecessary contractions in the big muscles of your legs. It's an excellent study. It's a bit of a uh, rub your belly and pat your head kind of thing but you'll find that it really can teach you about when the quadriceps really become necessary versus when they're not necessary. And of course, as we can see, the timing is everything here. But you can see the way my, my momentum increases as I go forward because I don't have the support from my knees or the knees start to flap faster. This is all part of this, this study of, of how to find the support and how to organize yourself well. Now in this last part of the lesson, he does something very nice, which is he encourages you to separate the action of coming up to stand from your intention to do it. And he has you actually, he gives you the suggestion of putting a chair in front of you so you can rest your hands on it. And all you do is come forward enough to see if your pelvis is light enough to lift. So that you're not worrying about trying to stand up. You're not committing to that large of an action. And for many people, this is revolutionary just to be able to discover the timing of when to actually find the support from the feet, how much to delay the action in the, in the leg muscles, how to relax their belly as they come forward, all these kinds of things. You can see that when my head, head doesn't go forward, there's an awful lot of weight over my pelvis, and it's quite heavy to lift. But the further forward I come, the lighter it is to lift. Now on the way down, it's the same kind of problem. If my head doesn't come forward, Watch what happens to the descent. If my head just shifts forward, I have a smoother action. If my head just starts to fall back, boy, that weight really gets away from me fast. And it's an enormous strain in the muscles of the quadriceps and the knees. Many people who suffer with pain in the knees can really benefit from simply studying the act of counterbalance, as you see here. And the chair can, of course, just be an aid, a crutch. And it's a very useful crush to be able to study the different phases of the movement. There I am falling back and boom. How many people have you seen sit down like that all the time? They go back, they go back. Ugh! It's the point of no return and they crash into the chair rather than being able to support themselves all the way through the phase of the movement. Now, after you've done this a few times, the chair will start to provide you with a crutch and then you can get rid of the crutch and start to work without it. And you can still see that having your head that far out over your knees is what permits you that kind of power and support coming from your legs and from your pelvis. Now that you've seen the basic structure of the lesson, this last part is simply me using different elements in the lesson to test 
to play and to improvise with different elements of the lesson to see if the basic pattern is stable enough and flexible enough for me to take it into different, different variations. I urge you to pick up a copy of the book if you don't have it and carve out some time for yourself and go through the lesson on your own and see what happens because both the structure of the lesson and the process of discovery that it'll lead you to can be profoundly satisfying because you know yourself better and you move better and your Feldenkrais practice enables your posture and your movement and coordination to remain as pain-free and as efficient for as long as possible.